Good morning. Welcome to the Arthur Lakes Library and also welcome our attendees from the uh, live stream. Uh, and uh, uh, I am Ye Li, the scholarly communications librarian here at Colorado School of Mines. And it's our pleasure to co-host the Colorado Open Scholarship Series today, uh, together with other five university libraries. And our goal is really to work together to explore opportunities to open access, open data, and open educational resources. In the past few days, um, our, our, our speakers here from Spark, the Scholarly Publishing and Academic Resources Co 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 Coalition, uh, have already generated lots of discussions and energy on different campuses and through live stream across Colorado. Um, and today, we are fortunate to have not only one, but two speakers from Spark, Nicole Allen, Director of the Open Education Resources, and Heather Joseph, the Executive Director of Spark. And Nicole will talk about open education resources, reducing costs, expanding access, improving quality first. And around 10.45, we'll have a short break and we can have some lunch and mingle. And then we'll come back 10 past 12 to hear from uh, Heather about open access, tenure, and promotion. So um, our, our first speaker, Nicole, is, as I said, mentioned, is the director of open education for Spark. She's an internationally recognized expert and the leading voice in the movement for open education. Starting during her own days as a student, she has worked tirelessly to elevate the issue of college textbook costs and access to education in, into the public spotlight and to advance open ac openness as a solution in both policy and practice. I'm very excited that we can have Nicole here to start, kick, help us kick, up, kick start our conversation on campus about uh, OER. So now without further ado, let's welcome Nicole. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's uh, really a pleasure to be here in such a beautiful location. It's great to take a break from Washington, D.C. Um, to see such a fantastic series of events across the state and such interest and dedication to the issues of openness um, at, at Colorado universities. So uh, Spark is an organization that works toward making open the default for the way we share information and in research and education. We're a membership organization of academic and research libraries across North America and the world. And we believe that in today's world, with today's technology, we can do better. And we should be using the internet in the way that it was meant for, to benefit society. So my talk this morning is going to focus on how we can use openness as a solution in the field of educational resources. So I think everybody is familiar with college costs as an access issue and just our need to better leverage technology to improve instruction. And I'm going to talk about the problem and how traditional course materials are actually getting in the way of student success and then how openness can be a solution to that and provide a, a few examples and thoughts that you can take away uh, to use here at Minds. So I'm going to move. Do I have to use this? Uh, Slides aren't advancing. OK, okay great. Uh, so I'm going to move relatively quickly. Uh, I have a, a, a fairly large slide deck with lots of examples and citations and facts. Uh, you can download this whole slide deck online. Um, and you can find it. I just tweeted the link. And you can also find it at my slide share. So if you want to follow up on any of the projects or statistics I mentioned, uh, all of the details are embedded within the slides. Um, and they're, of course, under an open license and an open educational resource themselves. So uh, I want to start by talking about the status quo for course materials. So as you mentioned in my introduction, uh, I started working on this issue as a college student. Uh, my first year as a freshman, I walked into my college bookstore uh, to, to buy my course materials and discovered that my books cost over $400 for my first semester. And to me, it just didn't make sense. Uh, and this was in 2003, and textbook prices have more than doubled since then. Um, but it, to me, it just didn't make sense that my 21st century education, um, you know, in, in a world where I had access to huge amounts of information instantly for free on the internet, that I would be assigned expensive print-based closed textbooks uh, to support that education. Uh, and uh, that's why I've uh, dedicated my career to working on this issue. 
Uh, and I think that experience of walking into the bookstore and just being shocked by the high cost of textbooks is something that students here probably can relate to. So as I mentioned, the, the price of textbooks has been rising rapidly. And this, this graph illustrates the last 10 years. Prices have risen about 82%. Uh, which is about three times the rate of inflation and actually faster than tuition and, and fees nationally. And uh, if you look at the cost of textbooks uh, in the context of an education, it might seem small. Uh, these graphs illustrate the overall cost of a higher education at, at various types of institution. Uh, the second from the top is a four-year public institution and the light blue stripe in there is textbook costs uh, or books and supplies. And that amounts to about $1,200 a year uh, if you include supplies, which is a significant amount of money. But it is relatively small if you look at it in the amount that students are paying out of pocket. But the truth is that the majority of students in this country uh, don't pay their entire education out of pocket. They take out loans and receive financial aid that subsidizes the cost. Uh, and that aid goes to pay for direct costs like tuition, room and board first before it extends to other expenses. So textbooks, while it may not be the largest expense students face, it is often one of the largest out-of-pocket expenses they face and can have a disproportionate impact on students in terms of the financial decisions they're making and the hardships that they face when they're making choices at the beginning of the semester. Do I buy my books um, or do I pay my rent? Do I buy food for the week? Uh, and in many cases, it ends up being the straw that breaks the camel's back for students in, in terms of affordability. So I just want to illustrate this with one example of a textbook uh, price. And uh, this is uh, Principles of Economics by Man Q, which is kind of the canonical intro economics textbook that you'll find used at a lot of uh, uh, colleges and universities across the country. I'm not sure if you can see the price, um, but it's $406 to buy that textbook new. For intro economics. You know, it's an excellent book, but this material is well established. And this book costs over $400. And they're actually economic principles that explain why this book is so expensive, which you could learn about if you could afford to buy this book. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, from a student perspective, imagine walking into the bookstore your first semester and seeing that price. How are you going to come up with that money? How, you know, have you planned ahead for that? Probably not. So I think we all know, though, that there are ways for students to save money on textbooks. Uh, buying used books or going online to, to sites like Amazon or Chegg is common. Renting textbooks. A lot of bookstores now offer rental programs. Uh, we're also increasingly seeing digital options as an alternative. And here's the digital alternative for this book. It's $126. So it's a pretty big price cut, but it's still really expensive, over $100 for a digital supplement. Yes? Is this $126, is that uh, a time phase? Getting there. Okay. Uh, so you're exactly right. Uh, that's, that's the trick. So you don't know, when you go to this website, you don't know yet, until you put this in your cart, that it's actually six months of access to the textbook. And... Principles of Economics is often taught as a two semester course. So those six months aren't gonna cover the two semesters you'll need the book for. So this kind of model uh, is really concerning um, because it sets students up to not be able to own the materials that they're using for their 21st century education. Especially when we're talking about digital formats, when digital the digital format expands our opportunity to be able to save uh, and create multiple copies of and enable students to forever have access to their resources. This artificially limits it. And uh, I like to, to think about it this way. It's kind of like uh, the men in black approach to textbook. You know how they bring out that um, little thing that zaps your memory about seeing aliens. That's, that's what this model is. Um, it's the men in black model for textbooks. You better read it fast because that it's going to be taken away. Sorry, this is this is becoming a very dated reference. Um, so, <laughs> the Men in Black model to textbooks, um, and no, I don't have trademark clearance to uh, to call it the Men in Black model. But um, uh, this approach to digital textbooks is taking off 
uh, we're starting to see more and more campuses across the country and move in this direction. Um, Inside IHR Ed just did a big piece on uh, this idea of inclusive access for textbooks where the publisher uh, will offer students in a class uh, uh, the ability to pay for the textbook out of a student fee as opposed to buying it separately. So if a professor or school opts into this model, students are automatically charged. Um, in the case of the, the economics textbook, the $126, $126 that, the, uh, that the textbook would cost. And you know, that, that's concerning as, as a model. It's shifting to a system where we're no longer owning content, we're renting content. And when we think about education as cumulative and the information you're teaching students is of value, uh, telling them that they can't keep their course materials, that's just wrong. And so back to economics, the reason that this market is so broken is that it's uh, set up in a way where students are just captives uh, because students don't have any choice over what materials they buy. They're assigned uh, what materials to buy by their professors. And of course, we all know that's the way it needs to work because professors are the experts and know what kind of material is best for their students but it does create a really bad dynamic for students because uh, they don't have any choices. They have to pay whatever price the publishing industry sets for those materials, which is what's driving those rapid price increases. You know, it, in the, in the, over the past couple of decades, uh, all sorts of industries have been forced to transform, you know, music, film, uh, news, as the digital environment has just changed the world we operate in. But the publishing industry hasn't had to change because they have the ability to just increase prices indefinitely. Uh, and it's also expounded by the fact that there are only five major publishers in the market that control the vast majority of it, who engage in the same kind of pricing and practices. So this creates a really high barrier to entry for any innovative alternatives to be able to enter into the marketplace. So there's not a lot of competition in that respect. And what's interesting, though, is you may see in the news this trend that student spending on textbooks is actually going down. And you'll hear this from the publishing industry, the $8.8 .8 billion uh, publishing industry, that students are actually spending less on textbooks. And they say it's good news. But there's this other trend that I talked about before of prices going up. So this doesn't make sense, right? Spending is going down, but prices are going up. So part of it is these lower cost alternatives that have become available, renting and digital options and being able to go online. But there are also signs uh, that students are simply opting out of the market. There have been a number of studies recently that have found that about two thirds of students now say that they have skipped buying some of their required textbooks because the cost is too high. Even though the most of the students who say this believe that it could hurt their grades by doing so. There are also other studies that look at uh, student success measures. So uh, about half of students say that they've taken fewer courses because of the cost of textbooks. They've been able to not afford to take uh, additional courses that help them get their, their degree faster, to enter the workforce faster, to help contribute to the economy faster, and to you know, have a less burden on taxpayers. Uh, there are also statistics that show that you know, a significant number of students have failed a course or dropped a course uh, or not uh, changed their major because of the cost of textbooks. And I like to point to this statistic a lot uh, with faculty members. Uh, a national study found that less than half of the students in any given course actually have the current edition of the textbook they've been assigned. So they're buying older editions or an international edition or perhaps a illicit edition that they found online. Uh, so, you know, we know that professors are selecting materials because they believe it's best for their students and they're doing the right thing. But the problem is the model for publishing those materials isn't delivering them in a way and at a price that students can afford and it's harming student success. And at the end of the day, students can't learn from materials they can't afford. And this is a problem we need to address. The good news is that in today's world, we can do better. And there are models for doing this. And this is where uh, Spark and uh, all of you come in uh, with the idea of openness and open educational resources. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about what that means. So some of you may have heard the term open education. 
which is a broad term that is used to describe the movement for removing barriers to education. And that can come in many different forms. It may be access barriers uh, or enrollment barriers. Uh, so institutions that, that are open access in that respect. Uh, it may be uh, things like MOOCs, where courses are taught online and people in remote places across the world can en enroll by, by logging in and, and, and tuning in to what the professor is saying. Uh, or it could be removing legal barriers, uh, which is very much what the open educational resources part uh, of the movement is about. And when we say open educational resources, uh, we're talking about any type of educational resource, uh, so the actual course content. So that could be a textbook, it could be a curriculum, a video lecture, lecture notes, uh, tests, assessments, any, any kind of material that can be used for education. And we use this abbreviation OER. Uh, so there's a long definition that describes uh, what OER means, but we uh, often just use this soundbite that, that captures the meaning, um, educational materials that are distributed at no cost with permission for everybody to freely use, share, and build upon the content. And this term open means something very specific in the context of open educational resources. So it means free, meaning free of cost and free of barriers, that the educational resource is distributed for free. Uh, and then it also comes with permissions, the permissions to use the material in all of the ways that are possible in today's digital world. Uh, and we often sum up these permissions using the 5R framework, <laughs> which um, uh, uh, kind of encompasses all of the things that you can do when you have an open educational resource that you have permission to do. The right to retain, meaning to keep and control a copy forever. Uh, so there's no men in black moment and you know, a student can actually keep copies of all of their educational resources for the rest of their life. Uh, the right to reuse, meaning to take a resource and use it in any context you want, uh, whether it's educational or otherwise. Uh, revise, meaning to take a copy of a resource and uh, make it locally relevant, make it fit your course better. Uh, I've never met a professor who feels like the textbook they're teaching from is perfect for their course. Well, this is the opportunity to do so. Uh, for example, you might want to take out, um, uh, for, for a math workbook problem that talks about, say, the Appalachian Mountains, here in Colorado, you might want to take out the Appalachian Mountains and put in the Rocky Mountains to make uh, the material more locally relevant to students. The right to remix, meaning to take multiple resources and mix them together. So you could embed a video in a text-based resource or take you know, multiple chapters of different textbooks and create a new one. And then finally, the right to redistribute, meaning to share it in any format or context you want. So this can mean uh, uploading it to your LMS and making that available to students that way, or printing out copies and sharing those, uh, or even just posting it online for anybody to see. And this idea of permission uh, is really important. Uh, and it grows out of this kind of tension we see in today's world, where technology has enabled us to do really amazing things uh, with content. You know, it's second nature now on the web to do things like copy and paste and share and edit, uh, like, tweet, uh, and it's very interactive. And there, there are lots of um, things we can do that we couldn't do before. I, I mean, there was a point where the idea of cut and paste literally involved scissors and glue. Uh, but now editing in a document is actually really easy uh, on uh, when it's when it's in a digital format and it's created the opportunity for us to truly tailor make education because education isn't one size fits all. Uh, but the challenge is that our copyright laws in this country by default prohibit all of those activities without asking for permission. And that's why this idea of openness is important because it grants that permission in advance when you know, the creator of the material uh, chooses to publish something openly. And the legal mechanism that's often used is an open license. And some of you may be familiar with the Creative Commons licenses. Uh, Creative Commons is a nonprofit organization that's developed a set of legal tools that make it really easy to share your work. Uh, if you wanna do that, there's a range of different licenses that have different levels of permission all the way from uh, public domain at the top, which means you release all copyrights all the way down to licenses that um, let you distribute things verbatim um, and for non-commercial purposes. Uh, and generally, anything where you can do the five R's uh, with a resource is considered OER. 
So now that we've talked a little bit about what OER is definitionally, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the OER space and what it looks like. So one of the OER projects that I think a lot of people have heard of uh, is MIT's Open Courseware program. So this came out in the early 2000s, and the idea behind it was to enable professors at MIT to share the ed great educational materials that they were already creating. Uh, and since then, by doing that, over 200 million people all across the world have accessed and used these resources. And they've been translated, because they're open, translated into over six languages. And another 50 million people have used those translations. And it's been great for MIT. They've actually found that uh, a, a measurable number of students who apply to attend MIT have actually found out about MIT and decided to apply because they have accessed course materials that they were able to see through this program. So it's benefited the in institution by showcasing the world-class education that's offered in MIT. Uh, and also impacted a lot of people beyond the you know, few thousand students that, that attend MIT. Uh, so, uh, since then, over 200 other institutions across the world have launched open courseware programs like this and uh, made it possible for professors who want to share resources they've created to do so. For campuses that don't have this type of program, there are also a number of repositories online, and this is one example, oercommons.org, where anybody can go and post an educational resource. And you can go here and search uh, across a variety of different subject matters and find high quality educational resources uh, for all different uh, levels of education. And uh, go here yourself and, and publish resources you've created. So more recently, there's been a lot of focus on the idea of uh, open textbooks or open educational resources that are textbooks. And the most prominent project here in the United States is the OpenStax project, it's based at Rice University. And what they've done is it's, it's a uh, nonprofit publishing operation. Uh, and they work just like a traditional publisher. They get authors, they develop books, they peer review them, uh, and publish them for the whole world. The difference is that the books are available for free online for anybody to use, and you can purchase an optional print copy. Uh, and they've been focusing in the highest enrollment courses, so the, you know, Calc 101, History 101, uh, where the largest number of students are taking courses. And uh, sure enough, they have a Principles of Economics textbook that uh, instead of costing $400 or being $126 online, you can actually view online right now, if you go to this website, you can read this whole book. You can download a PDF of it. Uh, you can get the Bookshare audio version of the book. You can download uh, premium versions of, of the digital format if you want with embedded quizzes. You can get a hardcover version of this book for, for uh, $38 on Amazon. So it's a far cry. Um, and if you actually want to read about that economic principle that allows prices to rise, you can actually do that right here. Elasticity and pricing. <laughs> So uh, this, these OpenStax textbooks uh, have become widely used throughout the US. A recent study was done that found that actually 10% of the enrollments in high enrollment courses where OpenStax has books actually use these books, which is actually a remarkable uh, amount of market pen penetration for a new publishing operation. So it not only speaks to the quality of these resources, but also just the demand uh, in, the, in the US environment for uh, lower cost uh, uh, educational resources. So other types of resources that are being published uh, in, the, in the scholarly side of things, um, and, and Heather will speak a little bit more about the journal side of things later, but uh, in open access publishing, all articles that are published in open access journals are also under open licenses and can be used as open educational resources, PLOS is uh, uh, one of the most prominent open access journals. and. Uh, there are actually a number of open educational resources publishing projects that take content out of PLOS articles, whether it's graphs or images uh, or case studies, uh, sometimes even data that's published openly through these journals and embed them in educational resources. So uh, it's act by having access to this peer-reviewed, high-quality research, it's actually able to improve educational resources as well. Uh, OER can be large or small. 
So an example of a, a big OER project uh, is Carnegie Mellon University's Open Learning Initiative, where they actually create entire courses that are made of OER, where you can go online and, and take a full semester course on a variety of different subjects. And all of the content built into it is OER, including adaptive assessments and, and uh, software that actually gathers uh, really useful data on student learning that Carnegie Mellon as a research university actually uses in their um, instructional psychology research. But they also use it to improve the content. So when they see their areas where students tend to be doing um, not as well as they expected, they can actually go in and address that problem by improving the content or A-B testing the content. And that's one of the really powerful things about the open environment. You know, there are a lot of traditional publishers that are now building in analytics to textbooks that create data and allow instructors to kind of know what, um, how their students are doing. But if you identify a problem in the content, a concept that it's not you know, helping your students learn, you are powerless to change the resources that you're teaching with because they're held by a publisher. You don't have the 5R rights to go in and, and change them and, and make them right for your students. Whereas in the open environment, you do. So that's an example of kind of large scale OER. An example of small scale OER comes from the FET project at the University of Colorado, uh, Boulder, where we were yesterday. Uh, and what this project has done is develop a set of small simulations of uh, science concepts, so physics and physics, biology, chemistry. Uh, that help illustrate to students uh, core concepts. And uh, these resources are put out under an open license for anybody to use. They're widely used within uh, OER publishing operations, but they're actually also used by traditional publishers. Pearson has embedded a number of these simulations in their online content. And you know what? That's great. Uh, openness uh, is about um, improving the quality of education and expanding uh, access to high quality content, and that counts for traditional publishers too. So the final um, example of uh, how OER is being created that I want to mention comes from the policy sphere. So uh, a couple of years ago, the US Department of Labor launched a very large $2 billion grant program that has possibly one of the most ridiculous acronyms that has ever been invented, um, the TAACCCT program, uh, which stands for Trade Adjustment Assistance Community College and Career Training Grant Program. And the purpose of this was to improve workforce training programs at, at two-year institutions uh, for uh, trade-affected workers uh, to retrain them in new careers and develop a, a whole bunch of high-quality resources. And instead of just giving grants to individual colleges to improve their own workforce training programs, this grant program actually required them to openly license and reshare all of the programs that they created. Since they're being created with taxpayer funds, so that every other two-year institution in the country could benefit from the work. And you can actually find all of these resources, um, at least from the, the existing uh, rounds of grants that have completed at skillscommons.org. And my favorite example of this project is a university in, in Chihuahua, Mexico, uh, was developing, an, in partnership with USAID, the US aid organization, a, uh, a couple of training programs in aerospace and energy. And rather than starting from scratch and you know, paying a publisher or spending a bunch of money to develop their own curriculum, what they did is they actually took curriculum from these grants and translated them into Spanish and localized them and, and used them in their own context. So it was a great example of how the project uh, was able to support another US government uh, initiative more efficiently. But it also helped the people who developed the resources in the first place. The energy curriculum was developed in Arizona, which has a high Spanish-speaking population. And uh, because of the work that the Mexican college did to translate the resources into Spanish, those students now had access to the resources in their mother tongue, which uh, studies have shown uh, students learn more effectively when they're learning in their mother tongue. So I wanna talk a, a little bit and just illustrate uh, why this all matters. So the title of this talk was about uh, how OER are reducing costs, expanding access, and improving quality. And uh, I'll give a few illustrations of, of how that's happening. So first on the quality side, there's been a pretty substantial amount of academic research that shows the impact of OER versus traditional materials. 
And uh, this website, uh, openedgroup.org, is conducting a literature review project process where they're um, scouring the, acad the academic literature uh, on education and finding studies. And uh, they've, they've cataloged uh, two dozen studies that look at uh, how students do when they use OER versus traditional materials. And uh, uh, the overall trend is students do at least as well, and in many cases they do better. Some of the ways that, that it found students tend to do better is they tend to take after taking OER the, in one semester, they tend to take more credits the next semester. Uh, also, students uh, often uh, tend to get higher grades in courses. One illustration of that comes from Mercy College in New York, uh, where they observed a 12 percentage point increase in uh, the number of students passing the course with a C or better when the math faculty in this course transitioned from using an expensive traditional system to an open system. And if you talk to the, the people involved in this project, they talk about how it, not, it didn't just start about reducing costs, or it started out as about re reducing costs, but what they discovered through the process is that it was an opportunity for their faculty to have ownership over the materials they were using and really think about their students as they were designing it. And, it, and just make a better quality educational research, uh, experience for their students. So that's an example of how it impacts one course. Uh, it's uh, Tidewater Community College in Virginia. They actually developed a two-year business administration degree pathway where they use OER in every single course, at least one section of a course, where a student could literally get a degree without spending a single dollar on textbooks. And what this found is it reduced the cost of a degree by about 20%, 20, 20 and the number of students who were completing the course is actually increased by relieving that cost burden. And this idea of a two-year degree that's fully OER uh, works well in a community college context. Uh, in a four-year context, maybe not a full degree, but imagine your gen ed curriculum. Imagine all of the high enrollment courses that most of the students here take before they leave. If you could eliminate textbook costs in those courses, what impact would that have on students? What impact would that have for the reputation of the university? And when you concentrate the impacts of the cost savings and the benefits of, of uh, uh, having access to open resources, uh, you hear these incredible stories from students. And just one example of a student from this program, uh, she says that because because she was able to take this degree program without textbook costs, she was actually able to save enough money to give her daughter braces, which meant that for the rest of her life, her daughter would have a beautiful smile. And these are the kind of things that students face, especially non-traditional students, like single parents like Melissa. And this is the kind of impact that transitioning the way that, that we do course materials can have. Uh, another illustration of how institutions are, are working on OER comes from UMass Amherst, uh, another research university. Uh, their program has, uh, their library has led a really innovative program uh, that has been replicated at many other institutions where they've provided small mini grants to faculty who are interested in using OER instead of traditional textbooks. And it gives faculty a little bit of extra time and breathing room uh, to uh, be able to sit down and change their textbook because it does take work. And the library actually works with the faculty to identify uh, OER that fits their course that they can adopt. So it, it, it leverages the unique contributions and expertise that exist within libraries as information professionals uh, and people who know how to discover uh, and curate content. Uh, and it's an opportunity to just expand the role of the library uh, in, the, in the area of course content. And you can see the kind of impact that it's had for, for faculty. Uh, they've, they've worked with over 40 faculty so far across the institution, and there have been examples where student, uh, faculty have saved over $25,000 in just one semester uh, for, for their students. And uh, in many cases, it's, it's allowed the professors to do something they've always wanted to do, uh, but never had the time or effort, uh, time or ability to do it before. So this can also work well for authors. And one example are these two authors from a, a, a college out in California, Barbara Lasky and Student Dean. 
And they uh, wrote a traditional statistics textbook with a traditional publisher a number of years ago that went out of print and they had it privately published for a number of years uh, where, you know, they were selling it to a couple thousand students every year, but they decided then to uh, make it open. They did a second edition where they put some effort into revising it and updating it and digitizing it and released it as an open textbook for everybody to use. And rather than impacting only a couple of thousand students a year, they now have had millions of students all across the world who have had access to their content and benefited from it. And it's actually transformed uh, uh, the woman on the left, her career. Uh, she's become a dean since then, and uh, they received an award from the Text and, Acad Text and Academic Authors Association for the textbook. So it's an example of how publishing openly can really benefit authors too. And there are models developing to support publication. I think everybody recognizes that publishers add an important uh, value to the, the publication process, and writing a textbook takes work. Uh, not every professor needs to write an open textbook. There are plenty of them out there that, that people can use, but it is important that there are models to support this. And just to give one example, this, uh, the example I gave earlier, OpenStax, their business model is based around uh, raising a, a philanthropic funds as venture capital to develop the core content, content and pay authors to, to write the, uh, the basic books. And then they partner with a variety of organizations that sell optional products around the books. So that might be print copies, that might be enhanced uh, digital versions that have embedded assessments that help people, students learn faster. It could be tutoring services, it could be homework software. So there are lots of ways that uh, Open can serve as a platform uh, for innovative uh, learning technologies that you know, may cost some money but help students learn. The final example I wanna give really illustrates uh, the potential uh, of Open to uh, allow new forms of pedagogy. So this uh, book, uh, Project Management for Instructional Designers, was developed by a professor at Brigham Young University in Utah. So uh, he was teaching a course uh, called Project Management for Instructional Designers. It's a very narrow graduate level course and there's no textbook for this course. Uh, and what he did is rather than trying to assign, you know, five different textbooks to students and having them read like one chapter from each, he took a traditional text or a open textbook in traditional project management. So it was about general project management, but it was openly licensed. And then he assigned to his students to turn it into project management for instructional designer. So we all remember from being in school how, you know, a lot of the coursework you did is writing essays that, you know, you wrote and then the professor graded and then everybody threw away at the end of the semester. In this case, uh, the students were actually assigned a project that was contributing to a resource that was going to live on and uh, uh, teach students in future generations of the course and provide a platform for them to uh, expand uh, the, the, um, the literature available in, in this subject and critique the work of past students. And as a graduate student, you can see how that's really impactful because they actually get to get their name on this as a contributor. And the copyright date in this book is 2017. And there are not a lot of books right now that um, would have that. And this is just a great quote from the professor who did this, David Wiley, who's one of the leading thinkers in the open education movement. Um, he, he was teaching a course on project management and wanted students to have a experience in managing a project in instructional design. So he assigned a textbook. So I wanna close by quickly just running through a few thoughts on what you can do. So first, uh, think about opportunities where you can share. Uh, you know, as I said before, not everybody is ready to sit down and write an open textbook and share it with the world, but you know, are you creating content that would be valuable to share? Are there educational resources you have, or you know, are there pictures? Um, you know, these are all examples of organizations that, um, online platforms that probably many of you interact with in your everyday lives that enable open licensing and open sharing of works. So you may be publishing open things already. The second is to think about changing the default. So um, making open the default. Think about, can I use OER first and then move on to traditional materials rather than just thinking about traditional materials first. And there's a great resource that you can start with called the Open Textbook Library. Uh, it's published by the University of Minnesota and there are over 300 
uh, textbooks published here that uh, actually have been reviewed by faculty members. So you can read a little bit about their quality and what other subject matter experts think of the books. This is a great place to start when looking to see if there's an open educational resource in your course. Uh, third, to think about ways that uh, faculty can be supported on campus. As we know faculty are the linchpin. They're the creators of educational content and they're the ones who assign it. Uh, and they're, so they're the most important piece in all of this. And what support systems are here uh, at Mayans that could help support faculty? Uh, one example that I love uh, of the library playing a supportive role uh, was at Virginia Tech, where their library worked with their business school, who wanted to switch to an open textbook but didn't have the publishing expertise. Their library worked with the business school to uh, publish a fundamentals of business textbook that's now used in their intro business courses. And uh, they're actually, this is a, a, an area in terms of supporting faculty where we're seeing the library community really step up and uh, provide many different types of support. This is one of them. Uh, the example I gave earlier, at Uni University of Massachusetts Amherst, where the libraries work with faculty to identify course content. Uh, and I think this is a really uh, exciting to us as Spark as a library membership organization to see the important role that the library community is playing here. And then finally, I, I, I just want to uh, close on the thought of uh, missions. So uh, I, I visited a lot of universities across the country and um, it pretty much everyone, if you look at their mission statement, open is embedded uh, in it somewhere. And here at Mines, it, it jumped right out at me. Um, oh, that doesn't really work. Um, uh, <laughs> so uh, apologies for that. Um, so a student-centered institution focused on education that promotes collaboration, which is enabled by openness, integrity, perseverance, creativity, which open enables, lifelong learning, so students have access to their materials long-term, uh, and responsibility for developing a better world. Think about the great education and educational resources and knowledge, knowledge that is being produced here at Minds, and what you can be doing to help make sure that that serves not only your students here, but your community and the rest of the world. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. And uh, we have probably a, a couple minutes for a few questions. And Nicole, please repeat the questions for our online. Certainly. Audience. Thank you. Yes. So, um, when you, you talked about uh, the statistics textbook in particular, uh -huh. and how initially it basically didn't have very wide adoption, mm -hmm. and then it went free, mm -hmm. and then it had a wide adoption. So, what would you say to someone who might argue that, you know, the market said that this textbook maybe wasn't very good? Mm -hmm. and wasn't worth it and then it went free and now maybe it's only being adopted everywhere because say states some some states have instituted rules that might say you have to use the cheapest resource possible and so mm -hmm. people are using that resource not necessarily because they want to but because it's the best resource mm -hmm. but because it just happens to be Sure, so the question was about uh, the quality of open educational resources and if people are using them, uh, could it be that they're just free, not necessarily that they're better? Uh, so uh, thank you for or the question, or, or even as good. So thank you for the question. And I, I think it comes back to our notions of quality. Uh, and you know, a lot of times we think about quality as um, you know, things we can see, like is it hardbound, is it color, is it typeset? Uh, but uh, I cited earlier in the talk a bunch of academic studies that actually look at the, the measure of quality that matters most, which is student outcomes. And in, in the courses that have been studied about OER, it is shown that students do as well, if not better, when using open educational resources. So I can't speak to the quality of that individual book, I'm not a statistician. Um, but there's ample evidence that shows uh, that student outcomes are good, and I think in terms of quality, that's all that matters. Yeah. So uh, some states are beginning to uh, 
uh, introduce coordinated efforts um, to, to promote OER uh, at state level across all public higher education institutions. Can you share a little bit about what might be happening in the state level? Certainly. So uh, there, there is a bill going through the state legislature right now that is uh, going to create a uh, council uh, of different constituencies across the state and higher education institutions uh, to make recommendations, so do some research and make recommendations around uh, what Colorado can do to better expand the use of OER and they'll also contract with an outside entity um, to do some work on supporting OER. And I think that kind of approach has been taken in a number of other states. The, the language of the legislation um, looks similar to legislation that's passed in California and Connecticut, which both have had fairly successful OER initiatives. So I think that's really promising. Um, I'll also note uh, that uh, uh, the U.S. Congressman uh, for, for Boulder, which is kind of in this area, uh, Jared Polis, I'm not sure if he's the rep for this district, um, no. Uh, but he's actually been a, a great champion for this issue in the U.S. Congress and uh, has introduced legislation in the past two Congresses uh, that would create a grant program to support OER at institutions of higher education and um, also helped get some language passed uh, in K-12 legislation that made um, open educational resources and allowable use of funds for state block grants. So there's lots of interesting things happening at multiple different levels of government. In terms of the most successful state-led initiatives that I've seen, um, I, I think probably the, the gold standard would be Affordable Learning Georgia, which is an initiative at Georgia's public universities, uh, where, they've been where there's a central project that provides incentive grants to institutions that they can use in innovative ways on their campuses to support OER adoption, and they just have incredible success stories that come out of that, and they share best practices and, and just test different ideas. Um, and Texas is actually uh, considering legislation that would create a similar grant program there. Uh, and then also an interesting idea uh, that, that I, I saw out of the state of Rhode Island, their governor issued a challenge to the higher ed institutions in the state. Um, it wasn't a funded initiative, but they issued a challenge to the institutions in the state to save students $5 million over five years using open textbooks. And it's actually proved really successful at just raising awareness and um, uh, just uh, uh, motivating institutions to look at the solution. Uh, I think once the public kind of understands that there are alternatives like this out there, uh, it creates, uh, it, it opens doors uh, at institutions. Heather? I, I never get to hear you talk, so this is great. Um, so I have a question kind of tying those two questions together. Maybe. How, are, is there specific language or approaches that policymakers are taking to make sure that when they're trying to do what I would say is the right thing to incentivize and fund the creation and adoption of OER, that they're somehow tying the, 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 the measures of quality that count mm -hmm. to those efforts as well, right? So it's not just, hey, I'm challenging you in Rhode Island to save your students money. We want to do that and make sure that the quality of their education is continuing to rise. Is, are there mechanisms that you're seeing that are being used to do that in the policy environment? So it's an interesting question. It was about uh, whether there are mechanisms in legislation to ensure quality. I think that, uh, it, so in some ways, the quality of education is assured by the faculty. I mean, they have agency in the classroom and academic freedom to select materials. Uh, that would be appropriate for their students. And I think the most important thing legislation can do is uphold academic freedom and reinforce that they want faculty members to first and foremost deliver the best education they can for students. And as part of that, consider the use of OER. You know, we never support mandates. Mandates are not the right way to go on this. Um, but if it can build clarity in the language around supporting quality and empowering faculty to make the decisions that are best for their students, um, I, I, that's the best approach. Yeah. So, one more. So, so, as a parent who has three kids in college, I'm all for let's figure out how to reduce the cost. However, it's far more complicated than that. And so, in some cases, it's just shifting who's paying for. Yeah. And as you said, if the resource doesn't exist, it costs money to make it. So the Fed example you had had huge money coming from NSF and other places. NSF no longer funds that kind of development. Um, the M 
MIT example, many of our best users. So here's the free one. So if you want the whole course, you got to go get these other resources and talk about the ways of getting it. And so is are the different groups working to also look at the funding mechanism? Because the other part is universities and faculty members often make money. Yeah. Off of developing the materials and the things and things like that. So if that goes away, if the full resource isn't available to every free, even if it is, it may be that the paid book is similar to the free book. However, the paid book comes with all these online resources and the little libraries on the pieces. Whereas if I do this, it might take me a hundred hours to put that together. So the core of your question is about sustainability and how open models uh, can develop um, and continue to be sustainable. And I, I, so I acknowledge that uh, there is still a lot of work to do to develop sustainable, sustainable models around openness. But at the core, the question isn't uh, about uh, you know, who pays for it, it's about efficiency. And if you look at the way the traditional publishing market is structured, it is possibly the least efficient way that you could possibly come up with <laughs> um, for distributing knowledge. Uh, and you know, the statistic I cited before that um, you know, only a small percentage of students in every, any given class are buying the current edition of the textbook, which means that publishers are only making revenue on those students, which is one of the reasons that prices have been ballooning out of control because fewer and fewer students are buying their books. Uh, so I think what the, the opportunity for openness is to focus in the areas where we can do things more efficiently with openness. So um, at least from the business perspective. So OpenStax, for example, has a really smart approach where they're focusing on the high enrollment courses where the material is well established. If you take the top five biology textbooks from the traditional publishers and open up their table of contents, they cover virtually the same stuff in virtually the same order. So we can do that openly. And if we can figure out a way to pay for it once, the entire world can use it forever for free. And individual professors who have different teaching styles have the power to tailor it to their own needs. Uh, so that isn't gonna work in every single subject, but if we focus in the areas where there is an opportunity, uh, I, I think that that's really the power that open provides. Um, it's not gonna be an overnight shift but we can move in that direction and move toward more efficient models that can deliver course materials to students in ways that they can actually afford and benefit from. And then I'll also note on the more uh, professor-driven side of things, uh, in terms of the materials that professors are already creating in their education, uh, being able to share those uh, is, is really powerful. And I think professors really value um, as teachers and scholars getting their knowledge out to the world and creating more opportunities to do that, uh, I think will become more and more common. Uh, and then, of course, there are some professors who publish traditional textbooks and make royalties. I have met maybe one or two professors that has, have, have felt satisfied by the amount of royalties that they receive on their textbook and felt that it really justified the value of their textbook um, or matched the value of their textbook. So authors are frustrated with the traditional system too. And uh, so I, I think everybody is, is in agreement that we need to make a change. And it's just, what's the most efficient way to do it? Well, let's take one more quick question from students. Well, okay, so, so my question is actually pretty, pretty similar along that line, mm -hmm. in terms of sustainable, because it's <clears throat> in terms of nonprofit models that you see um, kind of across the whole spectrum of, of initiatives that we're trying to push is that there's a, there's a problem in terms of how you achieve that in sustainability. So um, that was a good thing. So I guess my follow-up then is, um, even for these kind of traditional coursework, work, um, you're not necessarily just establishing it once. Maybe it has a relatively long period of change at this point, but there are things that do need to be changed and revised and updated. Mm. And so how do you um, ensure that the quality of your open source, of your open, um, textbook doesn't kind of degrade over time because it's mm -hmm. not a market force kind of keeping it in line with yeah. what current um, you know, best practices are. Yeah, and that's a, a 
really a valid question. Uh, so with open resources, there do, do need to be sustainability plans around resources, whether that's a community of practice, practitioners that contribute to keep a resource alive. I think there's some great examples from the math community um, where just you know groups of professors uh, keep resources up to date. Uh, OpenStax, with the revenue they receive through their um, commercial partners, they keep their books up to date that way. So that's really important. But I'll also come back to this idea of efficiency um, and how the traditional market is very inefficient. Um, I'll give you one example. Uh, a, a couple of years ago, there was this open textbook project in Michigan. Who there's this big news article that you know there are a bunch of errors in the textbook and they treated you know they talked about slavery in a way that was insensitive and um, uh, so. They um, uh, actually were able to change the textbook, so update the errors and fix the insensitive language within 48 hours. The next week, a scandal came out with about uh, language that was in a McGraw-Hill textbook, a traditionally published textbook. Their solution was uh, to fix the language is they sent stickers to institutions who wanted to purchase them uh, and they uh, offered, uh, they would print a new edition of the textbook that, student, that schools could buy. <laughs> so it's like, how fast do the changes reach to the students? Uh, and I think the open model creates an opportunity for that to happen so much faster and in real time and be much more current. Uh, so we need systems organized in order to do that. Uh, don't wanna diminish that, but the potential is so much greater. Wonderful. Now let's thank Nicole again for a wonderful